Number one help me, a few years ago my boss went on holiday for a couple of weeks to Spain. Midway through the holiday he got a phone call from the police informing him that his sister had, passed away, in a fire in her flat. So he rushes back home early, deals with the police and the passing, and everything, my employers told him to take some time off to grieve, which he duly did. When he came back to work on a Monday morning a few weeks later, we invited him into our coffee room to talk and offer him our sympathies and support. About half an hour later he excuses himself to start work, he walks into his office, sits down at his desk, turns on his computer, and checks to see if there are any answer phone messages. And the very first message that plays is his sister, screaming down the phone, help me. Help me. I'm trapped I can't breathe, still sends chills down my spine to think about it. As you can imagine, he was pretty traumatized, number two the voice, my grandfather told me this story about how one time he was sitting in a chair in front of the house when he heard his wife repeatedly calling him from inside the house. The thing is, my grandmother passed away a few years before that. But he told me that the voice was so pressing that he actually got up to look inside the house, and as soon as he got inside he heard a loud crash behind him and turned around to see that the chair he has been sitting in moments ago had been crushed by the cast iron gutter that fell on it, if he didn't come inside the house he would have probably been seriously injured. Every time I think about it, it sends chills down my spine. Number 3 Apocalypse is coming, in September 2014, a Utah boy discovered his parents and three brothers deceased after arriving home. The Salt Lake Tribune reported finding a to-do list in the house, which included tasks like feed the pets and find someone to watch the house written on it. The found list gave the impression that the parents were preparing to go on vacation. However, there was no suicide note, no warning that they would do this, and no explanation. After autopsies, it was revealed that the five family members consumed a lethal concoction of drugs that September day. However, why and how the parents and kids consumed the drugs remained a mystery. Sometime later, police revealed more terrifying information about the case. According to family members' statements, the parents' motivations included believing that the world's end was near and frequently spoke of leaving this world. Apparently, scared of the apocalypse, the parents poisoned the kids and themselves. Number 4 Car at the Red Light, driving home with a buddy from the high school summer job at the local amusement park. It's about 3 in the morning, and there is no traffic at all. Get stuck at the red light that never ends and while we are waiting, another car pulls up next to us, a big black hearse, in immaculate condition, with a clown in the driver's seat, with full makeup and costume on, he never moved, didn't look at us, nothing, just stared straight ahead the whole time. Number 5 I just need a haircut, I was an RA in a dorm for 2 years in college. A girl who had been having stress issues finally snapped. She was found by someone in a dark stairwell, I was in an older dorm, circa 1887, so there were plenty of nooks and crannies. By the time she was found she had already torn out over half of her hair and had eaten. She just kept on saying, I just need a haircut, in a perfectly normal voice. It took six of us and the police sedating her to finally get her strapped down to an ambulance gurney. To this day I can't forget how powerful she was. She couldn't have weighed over 120 pounds. Yet she had this sort of superhuman ability to rip her arms away to tear out another clump of hair and stuff it into her mouth. All with a perfectly straight face. Number 6 Milwaukee Cannibal, between 1978 and 1991, American serial killer and SX offender Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, monikered as the Milwaukee Cannibal, slayed and dismembered 17 men and boys aged 14 to 33. Dahmer dismembered and kept their organs and bones in his home and used them for carnal pleasure, sources claim that Dahmer was fascinated with deceased animals from a young age. When he was four years old, Dahmer may have noticed his father removing animal corpses from the house's foundation. This may have sparked his mania with deceased animals. Dahmer referred to animal bones as his fiddlesticks, and was oddly pleased by the sound the bones made, in 1991. After one of his potential victims escaped, Donner was captured and admitted to his crimes. Despite being diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and psychotic disorder, Donner was named to be legally sane at his trial. Three years later, a fellow inmate fatally beat him, on September 21, 2022. Netflix released a 10-part biographical crime drama series Dahmer, Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. Soon, Netflix's dramatization of Dahmer's murderous rampage in Milwaukee received a massive backlash from the public and people whose relatives were butchered by Dahmer. 
Number 7 The Perfect Crime On November 10, 1923, Nathan Leopold committed to travel six hours from Chicago to the University of Michigan. Accompanied by his friend and lover, Richard Loeb, they intended to break into Loeb's former fraternity. But all they had taken was a typewriter, a few watches, some pen knives, and around $80 in loose change. Leopold was agitated on the way back to Chicago because the robbery had been a big effort for a small payoff. When Leopold finally stopped complaining, Loeb began to discuss his idea of committing the perfect crime. While they continued to travel through the country roads toward Chicago, they broke into several homes and started a few fires, but none of their crimes had been published in the media. Loeb desired to commit a crime that would create a huge buzz, abduction and homicide of a child. After plotting their plan through the winter, in May, they kidnapped the child they knew had a wealthy father who would pay the ransom. Following the abduction, they beat the boy's skull with a chisel, jammed a rag down his throat, and disposed of the body. When the two returned to the city, Leopold dropped the ransom letter into a post box. However, their plan to execute the perfect crime failed. The following day, a passerby spotted the child's lifeless body, and soon the police traced Leopold by finding the eyeglasses he dropped near the body. On May 31st, 10 days after the homicide, both young men came clean and revealed to the state's attorney how they had slayed Bobby Franks. Nathan Leopold confessed that they had killed Bobby only for the thrill of it. At the time of the murder, Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold were 18 and 19 years old. They were sentenced to 99 years in prison. Number 8 Marrakesh Arch Killer The late 1800s saw the homicides of at least 36 women by Moroccan shoemaker and trader Hajj Mohammed Mesuli. Monikered as the Marrakesh Arch Killer, he hosted dinner parties for affluent women at his home, where he would drug them and then decapitate them with a dagger while they were asleep. He robbed them of their possessions and money and buried them. Authorities in Morocco recovered the remains of 20 mutilated people in a deep trench beneath his store, and another 16 were located in the garden outside. Mesfiwi admitted that he slayed for money, often very modest sums. In 1906, Mesfiwi was eventually arrested and executed. Mesfiwi was initially ordered to be crucified. However, the sentence was then altered to beheading in response to public outrage. Ultimately, it was decided that he should suffer. Every day for four weeks, he was carried from his cell onto the market square and whipped ten times with a rod made of prickly acacia. On June 11, 1906, Mesfiwi was to be walled up alive in the Marrakesh Marketplace Bazaar. Mesfiwi went silent on the third day, and many people in the crowd expressed their rage that he perished too quickly. Number 9 Cell Phone Stalker In 2007, ABC News reported on a series of ominously precise great threats made to different families via cell phones. The families claimed that the calls, which threatened to slay their children, pets, and grandparents, came in any time at night. According to one family, the callers seemed to know when the kids left for school and when they were home alone. Families also received voicemails with recordings of their private conversations. According to the victims, the caller was aware of their activities and what they were wearing. The family of Courtney Kuykendall, 16, said that her cell phone started sending text messages to her friends by itself in February, which is when the family's problems began. The Kuykendall family also reported a caller having a scratchy voice and threatening to slice their throats, which continued for months. Another victim reported receiving a call from an unknown caller saying they preferred lemons when the woman was slicing limes in her kitchen. The police couldn't find the perpetrators. Number 10 Anonymous Caller, around 1980. A single mother of a toddler, Dorothy Jane Scott, started getting threatening phone calls at work. She paid the calls little attention until one night when the ominous voice on the other end of the line instructed her to look outside. On her car's windscreen was a single withered rose. The stalker would alternate between declaring his love for her and making threats of physical harm. The caller's voice sounded familiar, but Dorothy couldn't place who it was. And she never got to find out, at a staff meeting, Dorothy noticed that one of her co-workers appeared unwell. She and another co-worker took the man to a neighboring hospital. Dorothy went outside to the parking lot while her two co-workers waited for the prescription to be filled. She wasn't seen again after that, according to her co-worker's testimony, they went outside to meet her in the parking lot after she didn't return. They suspected a problem had occurred with her son when they spotted her car rushing away as soon as they left the building. Neither her son nor anyone else ever saw or heard from Dorothy again. Her burned remains were discovered at a construction site four years later. 
The discovery of a collection of dog bones next to her remains added even more confusion to the case. No one has ever been found guilty or detained on suspicion. The caller has never been located. Number 11 Texarkana's Phantom Killer, in 1946, in Texarkana, her horrifying crimes occurred in less than three months. On the Texas side of the town, three violent incidents targeted young people parked in lovers' lanes. The fourth, on the Arkansas side, was the shooting of an elderly couple in their remote farmstead. After the shooting spree, five individuals were lethally shot, and three suffered critical injuries. The cops received very little information from the distraught survivors, the homicides shook the community to its grounds. While husbands were away on business trips, women packed up their belongings, took their kids, and checked into the hotel. Others devised security systems in the style of Rube Goldberg by connecting pots and pans to wire laid throughout their property. Normally unarmed citizens placed pallets on the floor so their kids could lie next to them as they slept with loaded pistols. Texarkana Gazette dubbed the assailant the Phantom Killer, several books about the case have been written, and a highly fictionalized film called, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, was made in 1976. In 2014, a remake of the original movie was released. The Texas Department of Public Safety once referred to Texarkana's serial killings as, the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history. Number 12, Haunted Elsa Doll, the creepy, old-fashioned porcelain doll with a Victorian appearance, red lips, rosy cheeks, and blue eyes, referring to Annabelle, may come to mind when one thinks of a haunted doll. However, it's unlikely that anyone still keeps one in their house. Unless that house is Warren's Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut. However, those dolls are not the only ones getting possessed, Disney's Frozen Elsa Doll, given as a Christmas 2013 gift in the Houston region, made headlines when it appeared to start acting paranormal. For two years, the doll was working as it was technically supposed to, reciting phrases from the movie and singing Let It Go when a button was pressed. In 2015, it started randomly alternating between English and Spanish languages, the woman who purchased the doll claimed that, even with its switch off, the doll would start speaking and singing randomly. In December 2019, the family chose to get rid of the Elsa doll. Despite tossing it in the garbage, the family eventually discovered it hidden inside a bench in their living room weeks later. Following the discovery, Elsa started to speak and sing solely in Spanish, soon after which the family made another attempt to scrap the Elsa doll. The doll was double bagged and put at the bottom of the garbage can, which was soon picked up by waste collectors, the family left for a trip sometime later, but when they were back, the haunted doll was waiting in their backyard. In their last attempt, the family sent Elsa through the mail to a Minnesotan family friend, who fastened the possessed doll to the front bumper of his truck. According to the woman's most recent update in October 2020, the doll hasn't returned to Houston. Yet. Number 13 The Monster Killer, Yang Xinhai, dubbed the Monster Killer by the Chinese media, is thought to be the worst serial killer in China's modern history. From 1999 to 2003, he was accountable for more than 67 homicides and 23 are PES. The homicides committed by Yang occurred between 1999 and 2003. He would break into his victims' homes at night, slaying every person inside, primarily farmers, with axes, hammers, and shovels, often an entire family. He always wore brand new clothing and oversized shoes. In one horrific homicide case, Xinhai forced the victim's husband and their six-year-old daughter to watch as he arped the woman. He slayed them afterward. At the time of his arrest, various media sources claimed that Yang's motivation for the homicides was revenge against society due to a bad breakup. According to rumors, his girlfriend broke up with him due to his past convictions for a P.E. and stealing. On February 14, 2004, Sheen Hai was executed by firing squad, number 14 the coroner, I used to work in a hospital, in the IT department, and we did a number of overnight rollouts, as well as on-call work slash response when issues occurred overnight. Many weird things happened or appeared to happen, the thing that struck me as oddest, was when I saw the coroner running at full speed down the corridor, in the opposite direction, towards the morgue. This guy, an older guy in his 50s or so, was going at full speed. I had never seen him above an amble before, but this time he was really going for it. As he got close to me he yelled, out of the way, I got another live one. I am not sure what was more disturbing, the fact that he was dealing with what I could only assume was a, deceased, body that now appeared to be alive or the fact he said, another. Number 15 Donald Henry P. Wee Gaskins Jr. 
American serial killer Donald Henry Gaskins boldly proclaimed to have stabbed, shot, drowned, and poisoned hundreds of people. Due to his small frame, his friends and relatives referred to him as Pee Wee. He was under 130 pounds and about 5 feet 2 inches tall, despite asserting that he slayed between 100 and 110 people, investigators never discovered concrete proof of the homicides. 10 of the 15 victims Gaskins was verified to have slain during his lifetime were under 25 years old, and 5 were underage. After attempting self-harm in prison, Gaskins was executed in the electric chair on September 6, 1991, number 16 The Butcher Baker, Robert Hansen was a reliable husband, father, and respected part of Anchorage society. The monikered Butcher Baker, however, held many sinister secrets. Between 1971 and 1983, he abducted, assaulted, and slayed at least 17 women aged 16 to 41, Hansen is thought to have commenced homicides around 1972. His modus operandi involved picking up a SX worker in his car and while holding her at gunpoint, driving her to his house, where he would RPE her. He would then take the victim to a remote location where he would hunt her like a wild animal before finalizing the demise, Hansen admitted that he took pleasure in using a knife and a gun to prey on his victims. Additionally, he acknowledged that he had little regard for women or their feelings. Hansen considered them to be just animals, things to be slain and hunted. In 1983, he was arrested, found guilty, and given a 461-year prison term with no chance of parole. He passed away in 2014 at 75 from natural causes due to lingering health conditions. Number 17 The torture of Sylvia Likens The homicide of Sylvia Likens was dubbed the worst crime ever perpetrated in Indiana. Fifty years later, the title remains, on October 26, 1965, police discovered Sylvia Likens' malnourished body sprawled on a filthy mattress in the Indianapolis home of 37-year-old Gertrude Banasuski, mother of seven and the mind behind the girl's horrific demise. The body was covered in more than 150 wounds, including burns and cuts. Reportedly, Likens' body was used as a practice dummy for judo flips and punches. Carving words into her stomach with a needle, and many more vicious attacks, Sylvia and her sister Jenny were housed with Banasuski for $20 weekly by their carnival worker parents. However, Banasuski beat the females, largely Sylvia, when the checks were late. Why neither Jenny nor Sylvia sought assistance before things got out of hand is, in fact, one of the unsolved mysteries surrounding the case. However, Banasuski wasn't the only one responsible for Sylvia's demise. A large group of local kids watched or participated in the vicious attacks. Along with some of Banasuski's kids, some as young as 10, even more astonishing is that all the criminals involved eventually got off on their misdeeds, some following laughably short prison terms. Number 18 The Killer Clown John Wayne Gacy was well known for dressing up as a clown at children's parties, but his clown masks covered a demonic visage. Between 1972 and 1978, he murdered and tortured 33 young men and boys in Cook County, Illinois. Gacy would usually entice a victim to his house and deceive him into donning handcuffs on the pretense of showing him a magic trick. Then, after torturing and arpaying his victim, he would asphyxiate or fatally strangle him with a garrote in Gacy's childhood. He was often named Sissy and Mama's boy, who would probably grow up gay, since his mother always sought to protect him from his father's abuse. Although Gacy believed he was never good enough in his father's eyes, he continued to adore him nonetheless. In 1949, the father of Gacy received word that he and another boy had been observed inappropriately touching a young girl. His father punished him by giving him a razor strop. The same year, Gacy would occasionally be used sexually in a vehicle by a family friend. The first homicide committed by Gacy was on January 3, 1972, at the age of 29. All of Gacy's slayings were carried out within his ranch-style home close to Norwich, a Chicago suburb. Most of Gacy's victims were buried in the basement of his house. The remains of his final four victims were dumped in Wisconsin's Des Plaines River. In 1994, the killer clown was apprehended and executed by lethal injection. Number 19 The Icebox Murders Case In 1965, Fred and Edwina Rogers and their adult son Charles were residing in a peaceful area of Houston. Family tended to keep to themselves, especially with Charles's antisocial and reclusive behavior. In fact, many neighbors were unaware that Charles lived at home with his parents as they never saw him around. A family member inquired that the Houston police check on his elderly aunt and uncle after not hearing from the Rogers for several days. 
The patrolman saw food on the dining room table but could not find Fred or Edwina. When they opened the fridge, many meat packages were neatly stacked on top of one another. Two human heads were then discovered in the vegetable bin. When more police officers arrived on the scene, they began to remove the bags of severed body parts from the refrigerator. They were Fred and Edwina Rogers' remains. Autopsies revealed that Fred had sustained a severe head injury from a claw hammer, while Edwina had been severely battered and shot. Fred's genitalia had been cut out, and his eyes had been gouged out. The internal organs of the pair had been flushed down the toilet, there was no sign of Charles. He is the only suspect in the case as of this writing. Charles was ruled deceased in 1975 because no sign of him could ever be located. The case has never been solved. Number 20 Botched Exorcism of Kennedy E. Fair. In August 2016, Kennedy E. Fair, 26, of North London, reportedly started acting strangely and aggressively after experiencing throat pain. Before his family restrained him to a bed using cable ties and excessive force, he allegedly bit his father, threatened to cut off his own pee, and spoke of having a python or snake inside of him. According to his brother, Kennedy needed to be restrained because he would hurt either himself or his family members. After Kennedy had been confined to his bed for three days, his brother called emergency services and explained that he had been complaining of dehydration. When the emergency services arrived, he was pronounced deceased at 10.17 a.m. The court was informed that the family spent those three days trying to heal Kennedy through restraint and prayer, all seven of Kennedy Ife's relatives were charged with manslaughter, false imprisonment, and allowing a vulnerable adult to pass away. Kennedy Ife's body had over 60 wounds, including what seemed to be a bite. On March 14, 2019, following a four-day jury deliberation, all seven family members were found not guilty of manslaughter. Number 21 The Unicorn's Secret In his adolescence, Ira Einhorn gave himself the moniker, The Unicorn, his German last name translated into English. When he slayed his ex-girlfriend Holly Maddox, Einhorn was an environmentalist and supporter of the anti-war movement. After leaving Einhorn's Philadelphia residence in early September 1977 to collect her belongings, Maddox vanished. When authorities questioned Maddox's ex-boyfriend about her whereabouts a few weeks after the disappearance, he said she had disappeared en route to the local co-op. Eighteen months later, the police discovered Maddox's partially mummified body in a trunk in Einhorn's closet after neighbors complained to the authorities about a foul stench. Einhorn fled to Europe a few days before he was set to go on trial, as he had previously been arraigned, Einhorn was tried, found guilty, and given a sentence in absentia. Despite this, Einhorn spent 23 years in France and even got married while deftly avoiding extradition. In 2002, the American government was able to repatriate him and reconvict him. Defending himself, he stated that the CIA had slayed his ex-girlfriend and had set him up. Einhorn was convicted and served a life sentence without the chance of parole until he passed away in prison in 2020. Number 22 The Only Passenger If you've ever been to Portland or you know that our public transportation system is pretty nice and the MAX system has a tram that runs between the airport and the city center until fairly late at night. I was coming home from seeing my family at Christmas and my flight came in very late so I was lucky enough to catch the last MAX home. Because it was so late it was just me Dot and the guy who looked homeless sitting a few seats ahead of me. He was sleeping with his head against the window. I paid little attention to him but noticed his head lolling around and wondered if he was wasted, anyway, we get to the city center and there are cops waiting there because apparently the homeless guy sitting in front of me is being escorted off the tram. Airport security had tried to get him off before and thought he was ignoring them and refusing to move. And that's when both the cops and I find out that the guy had been, deceased, the whole time. He had overdosed at some point before the Max had even arrived at the airport we had been riding on the dark midnight ride alone together with one of us fairly deceased. Number 23 America's Unknown Child In February 1957, in Philadelphia, a college student discovered a young boy's remains in the woods and called the police to report his horrifying find. Visibly severely beaten, the boy was found unresponsive inside an old bassinet box. No one knew who the young victim was, numerous people came forward with information about the crime. Still, the police could not verify any of their claims, and many theories were dismissed. However, the media and police have shown much interest in two theories. Each one has been thoroughly examined. In February 2002, a woman, only known as Martha, brought forward one of the main case theories. 
Martha asserted that the boy named Jonathan was bought from his biological parents in the summer of 1954 by her violent mother. She claimed that the boy experienced physical and carnal torture inside the home. Martha knew of information that had not been made public, raising the police's attention to her statement. The woman claimed that the young boy had baked beans just before being battered to demise. Supporting the autopsy findings. She also said that he had been showered just before he passed away, which was consistent with the coroner's discovery of waterproof fingertips. Although Martha's testimony appeared consistent with the evidence, her extensive history of mental illness rendered her an unreliable witness. The case stays unsolved and is open to this date. The boy remains unidentified, and his grave in Philadelphia at Ivy Hill Cemetery has a large headstone bearing the words, America's Unknown Child. Number 24 Kidnapping of Colleen Stan In 1977, Colleen Stan, 20, was hitchhiking from her home in Eugene, Oregon, to a friend's birthday when her abductor Cameron Hooker and his wife Janice picked her up. The following seven years, Stan would spend a large portion of her time, sometimes up to 23 hours a day, imprisoned in a wooden box without access to light, sound, or fresh air, eating cold food scraps, and using a bedpan. The young woman was also exploited sexually by Cameron using various items. Throughout those seven years, Stan was occasionally given freedom. She would have to care for her captor's children, cook and clean for herself, was allowed to go jogging, visit her family on her own, and even get a job. Still, she was always kept in place by brainwashing and threats, including claims that a mysterious and dangerous group known as The Company would slay her and her entire family if she tried to flee. But everything changed when Cameron said that Stan should be his second wife. Stan ultimately boarded a bus and escaped to her family. At the same time, Janice cooperated fully and turned in her husband in exchange for immunity. Stan, only a few months away from turning 28 at the time, wasn't free of her suffering until August of 1984. Even then, the many years of torture and brainwashing had kept her from reporting what had happened to the authorities. When the entire story was revealed to the public, it startled not only the police but the world as a whole, spawning hundreds of films, TV shows, and even songs. Number 25 The Otaku Murderer, Tsutomu Miyazaki, dubbed the Otaku Murderer, is one of the most infamous Japanese serial killers in history. He was convicted of slaying four young girls, aged 4 to 7, in Saitama and Tokyo between August 1988 and June 1989. He kidnapped the girls, slayed them in his car, then mutilated and molested their corpses. He also practiced cannibalism and kept their body parts as trophies. Miyazaki is said to have disassembled one of his victims' bodies, retained her hands, and continued to cannibalize and drink blood from them. In July 1989, Miyazaki was detained in Hachiji after being accosted while photographing a young girl in her underwear. Despite being diagnosed with one or more personality disorders, he was found to be sane and conscious of his crimes and their repercussions. Miyazaki received the most extreme sentence in 1997 and was hanged in 2008, number 26 horror behind the walls. In 2015, the Bretzoe's family in Auburn, Pennsylvania, wanted to insulate their home. While doing so, they soon discovered that their wall cavity had been used to store dozens of deceased animal carcasses, half-used spices, and other items. Other than that, the deceased animals were all wrapped in newspapers from the 1930s and 40s. After discovering all the deceased animals, the family sent the artifacts to a specialist to learn why someone would leave them in the house's walls. The expert claimed that the previous owner was most likely using Dutch magic, often known as powwowing. To treat ailments, the Bretzoe's family still doesn't know by whom or why animal carcasses were stuffed into the house's walls. They also claim that the mold on the decaying corpses in their home made them sick and that the odor just wouldn't go away. Number 27 The Velisca Axe Murder House, for ghost hunters, paranormal activity seekers, and adrenaline junkies, the Velisca Axe Murder House in Velisca, Iowa, is a well-known tourist destination. Paranormal investigators, familiar with the house, declared it among the most haunted locations in America following the summer 1912 mass homicide, right next to 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York, where five people were slayed in the fall of 1974. The case in which six children and two adults had their skulls completely smashed while asleep in bed was never solved and remains a mystery to this day. The location of a horrifying mass homicide was bought in 1994, restored to its 1912 condition, and turned into a tourist attraction. Paranormal investigators who have toured the house have produced audio, video, and visual evidence of paranormal activity in the place shrouded in mystery. Children's voices, falling lamps, moving ladders, 
and flying objects have all caused tours to end early, but the haunting changed into something more sinister in the fall of 2014. On November 7, Robert Stephen Larson Jr., 37, of Rhinelander, Wisconsin, had a routinely scheduled paranormal tour with his friends. Larson was found with a self-inflicted chest stab wound and was taken to a neighboring hospital. According to the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, the self-inflicted wound occurred at approximately 12.45 a.m., roughly when the 1912 axe murders in the home happened. Larson recovered from his injuries but never spoke publicly about what happened that day, the Villisca Axe Murder House is still operating today. At the time of writing, the price of the overnight stay is $428, and anyone over the age of 12 can take a tour, 